This is going to be a video about the Church of Christ and their false doctrine. And I'm just going to get right into it. We're going to look at all their most favorite and popular verses that they go to to prove that water baptism saves. I'm going to prove to you that water baptism does not save. Okay, the first thing is we're going to look at is what damns a person. One of their favorite verses is Mark 16, 16. And that says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, if you just take half the verse, it does look like water baptism saves. And when a man wants to teach salvation by water baptism, he ignores the other half of the verse. Look, it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, most definitely. But who's damned? He that believeth not, look at the second half of the verse, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So as a general rule, most people who believe will also be water baptized, but it is he that believeth not that shall be damned. The thing that damns the person is his unbelief. It isn't the failing to get water baptized. If a person believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and didn't get water baptized, they're saved and they're going to heaven. And plenty of verses prove this fact. For example, John 3.18, it says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So you see, it's not about water baptism on whether you're damned. It's about, have you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Second Thessalonians 2.12, that they all might be damned who weren't water baptized. No, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What, okay, if that's what damns a person is their unbelief, what saves a person? It is unbelief that damns a person. So what saves a person? Well, in Acts 16, 30 and 31, it, it says, And brought them out and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So Paul plainly says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He said nothing about water baptism when the jailer asked him how to be saved. The book of Acts is not my primary choice to go to to show someone how to be saved but it is the Campbellites which is the Church of Christ favorite place to go to so I'm going to be referring to it a lot but notice it isn't until after the man is saved that he gets water baptized see he asked Paul what must I do to be saved Paul says believe in the Lord Jesus Christ he does that and it's not until after this fact that he gets water baptized. In Acts 16.32, it says, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. So water baptism is one of many good things a person does after they believe. Just because you see people being water baptized following their belief doesn't mean it's part of their salvation. Just like anything else, just because you see me reading the Bible doesn't mean that that's part of my salvation. There's all kinds of good things that you do after salvation that don't have anything to do with the salvation itself. Paul lets us know that salvation has to do with a heart belief on the Lord Jesus Christ, not water baptism. In Romans 10, 9 through 14, he says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Paul says nothing about water baptism here. He plainly says, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. He's made righteous the moment he believes. He doesn't need water baptism to do any more cleansing of sin. He's already saved. His sins are already forgiven at this point. 
And Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So water baptism would definitely count as a work of righteousness. And it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And I'm going to prove to you that water baptism is a work of righteousness. It would, it's your own righteousness. It's your own good thing that you're doing. In Matthew 3, 13 through 15, it says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. See? It's a work of righteousness. And we are not saved by our own works of righteousness. It's only by the grace and mercy of God that we can be saved. Through His mercy and grace, He allows us to believe from the heart on Him and His finished work on the cross and receive the free gift of salvation. So how are we saved? By believing on Jesus Christ. How are we damned? By not believing on Jesus Christ. Now, another favorite verse of the church of christ is in first peter 3 20 through 21 it says which some time were disobedient when once the long suffering of god waited in the days of noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water the like figure wherein to even bath baptism doth also now save us not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the Church of Christ will use these verses to teach that water saves. Since Noah was saved by water, they like that verse, but take into consideration that Noah was not water baptized. Remember also that the water never touched him. He was in the ark. He was saved by water, in the sense that we are saved, yet so as by fire at the judgment seat of Christ. The fire never touches, touches us. In 1 Corinthians 3, the fire doesn't touch us. It's burning our works. Also notice how baptism is not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. My conscience bothered me about getting water baptized after I got saved, so I did it. It didn't save me from my sins. It saved me from a bad conscience. It it has nothing to do with uh, my my salvation. So they're going to take such a such an unclear verse like First Peter three twenty through twenty one that talks about a like figure, and it even says not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's doing. It's, it's not cleansing any more of my sins than believing on the Lord Jesus Christ did. All my sins were forgiven the moment I believed the gospel. It's simply the answer of a good conscience toward God. Just like a lot of things that you do after salvation are an answer of a good conscience toward God. But they'll take these two verses and override all of uh, what Paul's clear teachings on salvation with these two verses right here. So the next thing, what gives forgiveness? In Acts 2.38 it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So for the remission of sins, are they getting baptized to get remission of sins or because they already have it? For example, when you take Tylenol for a headache, is it to get a headache or because you already have it? It's because you already have it. Are they getting baptized to get remission of sins or because they already have it? Also remember, the book of Acts, it's a transition book. So we're going to let, are we going to let Acts 2.38 override all the clear gospel presentations that Paul gives in his epistles? Are you just going to use Acts 2.38 and override Romans 4.5, Ephesians 2.8 and 9? Are you going to override the clear verses and take, take verses out of the book of Acts, a transition book, and let that define your salvation today? Take into consideration also that in Acts 2.37, the people are asking Peter, what shall we do? 
and not what must I do to be saved in Acts 6, like they did in Acts 16.31. In Acts 16.31, Paul plainly told them, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 2.30, in the book, in Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching to a bunch of Jews that just crucified their Messiah. And they say, what shall we do? And he tells them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You've got different things going on in the book of Acts. For example, in Acts 2.38, they received the Holy Ghost after their water baptized. You go on later on, they received the Holy Ghost before their water baptized. In another place, they received the Holy Ghost when Paul lays his hands on them. It's you got something different going on in the book of Acts because it's a transition book. So I'm not going to run to the book of Acts. It's not my first choice when telling somebody how to be saved because you got different things going on. In Acts chapter 2, the, the Jews still have an opportunity to accept Jesus as their Messiah. And there's, there's still an opportunity for, the, for the, uh, them to take the kingdom. God's still offering it to him. He's not switched over to the Gentile. You see, if the Jews would have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, the church age would have never started. It never would have even started. You have to take all these things into consideration. So water baptism it isn't getting you forgiveness. So what does? Well, Revelation 1.5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Only the blood of Jesus Christ is going to get you forgiveness for your sins. Ephesians 1.7, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1.14 1 John 1, seven. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. So if you say that the blood of Christ is applied when you are water baptized by a church of Christ elder, you know why is baptism not mentioned in all these clear verses you have to go back to the transition book to to uh to to apply water baptism for salvation and you have to take things out of context if you say that the blood of christ is applied when you are water baptized by a church of christ elder then think about this that puts the church of christ elder in charge of the blood of jesus christ and if he doesn't baptize you, then you're just out of luck. I mean, you can believe all you want to, but according to him, unless you come to his church or maybe one of his friend's churches and be baptized by him, you're going to hell. And if he's not around, you're just out of luck, I guess. If you're about to die in a plane or in a car crash and you want to be saved, you're out of luck. You can sit there and tell God you're a sinner, tell God you want to be saved, and you know he died on the cross for your sins was was buried and resurrected and you you want to be saved and get the blood applied to you too bad there's no church of christ elder around you can't get water baptized at that moment so you're damned you see the problems that come in with all this nonsense if you don't have access to a church of christ pastor then you're just out of luck what if you're out in the desert somewhere what if you're in some some place in the world that doesn't have a, a church of christ elder that's all nonsense. I mean, it, you see, I've been, I've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and I've been water baptized. They would still say I'm lost because I was baptized by a Baptist pastor. Uh, they, um, they don't recognize my baptism. I know, uh, I'm not speaking for all Church of Christ, but I know some Church of Christ that uh, don't recognize the baptism, even if it was in a Church of Christ church because that church of Christ happened to use musical instruments. And they say, well, that canceled out the baptism. Romans 3.25, Whom God hath sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So you want forgiveness? Put your faith in the blood. It's not about water baptism. 
to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which gets water baptized. No, which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting, then? It is excluded by what law of works, nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Do you see, a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. It's not about your good works. And I understand water baptism isn't the law, the Old Testament law, but it is a good work in the New Testament. And if the Old Testament law, if keeping that can't make a man righteous, then how could keeping New Testament practices make a man righteous? You see what I'm trying to say? Now the next thing, what washes away your sins? Is it water? In Acts twenty two sixteen, And now why tarriest thou arise? and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The Church of Christ loves this verse. Once again, it's in a transition book. you got different things going on. They want to teach that it is the baptizing that washes away thy sins. But look at the verse. Notice how it's worded. Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, comma, calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord. The, wash, the washing away thy sins part is connected to the calling on the name of the Lord part, not to the be baptized part. Look, arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The, the washing away thy sins and calling on the name of the Lord is what's connected. And this makes sense when you compare Scripture with Scripture, because in Romans ten thirteen, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved not whosoever is water baptized shall be saved who not whosoever is water baptized washes away his sins also take into consideration in acts 22 16 who is the one doing the talking it is ananias he is a devout man according to the law in acts 22 12 through 16 and one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. In the same hour I looked up upon him, and he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be a his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord? I, Ananias was a devout man according to the law. And you got men like this in the book of Acts, like Apollos. He only, like he only knew the baptism of John, and... They had to take him aside and show him the way of God more perfectly. You see, there was change in doctrine going on. It's a transition period. You had men that didn't have the clear uh, Pauline teachings down. And you see, Acts is a transition book, and it's a historical book. And in Acts twenty-two sixteen, the Holy Spirit is recording exactly what Ananias said. And when the Holy Spirit records exactly what someone says... It doesn't mean that what that person said should be taken as as the clear teaching on salvation because he's just recording what they said. I mean, you, you got to go to the clear verses in the Bible, especially what Paul said in his epistles for salvation. I'm not saying that that any verse in the Bible is wrong. It's just, for example, go to Genesis 3. It records exactly what the serpent told Eve. But what the serpent told Eve to do wasn't the right thing to do, right? The Church of Christ would rather take a quote from Ananias, a devout man according to the law, somebody that probably doesn't have his doctrine completely straight like Apollos, and they'll use that as one of their greatest proof texts. Instead of using a clear verse from Paul, the apostle for the church, and they just use these verses out of the book of Acts to override all the clear Pauline teachings. Paul gives doctrine directly for the church in his epistles. And he plainly says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So why would you go to Acts twenty two sixteen to show someone how to be saved before you would go to Romans 10?
I think that's dishonest. So, another thing. When do you get the Holy Ghost? Well, in Ephesians 1.13, it says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So, why would you go back to Acts 2.38 to show someone how to get the Holy Ghost? They got, they did get the Holy Ghost after water, water baptism in Acts 2.38. But Acts is a transition book. And you're using that to override the clear teachings in the Pauline epistles. Paul clearly shows us that we have the Holy Ghost the moment we believed. It wasn't when we were water baptized. And if you want to use the book of Acts so much, let's go back to the book of Acts. Since it's a transition book, you got different things going on all the way through it. I'm going to show you where somebody gets the Holy Ghost before water baptism. And Acts 10, 47 through 48, it says, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Notice they received the Holy Ghost before they were baptized. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. And then think about Acts chapter 8, uh, 36, verse 36 through 38, where the Ethiopian eunuch believes before he's water baptized. So see, it's a transition going on in the book of Acts. I'm not going to take someone to the book of Acts. And that's not my first choice to show them how to be saved. Because there's a transition going on. Your first choice is on to show someone how to be saved is take them to the Pauline epistles, the book of Romans. Why do you think so many people use the Romans road to salvation? But what is the gospel? Another thing, what is the gospel? And notice I'm just telling you basic Bible doctrine. What gives forgiveness of sins? What saves a person? What damns a person? What is the gospel? The church of Christ have just completely corrupted and twisted this simplicity that's in Christ, the simplicity that's in the gospel. So what is the gospel? In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Paul makes it clear. Moreover, brethren, I, de I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul clearly lays out the gospel and shows how it's something we receive, we believe, and it says, it is this gospel by which ye are saved. And then the gospel, in this gospel, he proclaims that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and resurrected. He says nothing about water baptism. And to make this even more clear, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. Look what Paul says. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. If it is water baptism that causes you to come in contact with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, then why is Paul thankful that he baptized none of these guys except Crispus and Gaius? So he's glad that he didn't get any of them saved except for those two guys. That makes no sense if water baptism saves. Then he says, Lest any should say that I baptize in mine own name, and I baptize also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So Jesus Christ sent Paul not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Huh. So that, wouldn't that mean that water baptism has nothing to do with the gospel? And if Christ sent Paul not to baptize and baptism saves, wouldn't that mean that Jesus didn't send Paul to get anybody saved? Notice the focus that Paul has is on the cross, not water baptism. If water baptism saves... How could Paul have begotten the Corinthians through the gospel if he didn't baptize them? Think about that in 1 Corinthians 4.15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. 
For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Paul gave them the gospel. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They got saved. They were born into the family of God before they were water baptized. That's honest Bible study. The Church of Christ says we don't we only like to take a few verses and ignore verses. No, we're looking at all kinds of verses and showing you that but water baptism has nothing to do with salvation. The next thing is what is the spirit baptism? The Church of Christ just doesn't get it. When the church they don't understand it. When the Church of Christ sees the word baptism, they always think it's water baptism. But 1 Corinthians 12:13 says for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body whether we be jews or gentiles whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit notice it says for by one spirit it isn't a man doing the baptizing here it is the spirit you see at salvation the moment you believe the holy spirit baptizes you into the body of christ in galatians 3 26 through 28 it says for ye are all the children of god by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And see, they say, well, that's water baptism. But look at the next verse. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. This is one of the Church of Christ's favorite proof, proof texts for baptismal regeneration. That water baptism saves. The context shows that it's not water baptism, but rather the spirit baptism. One of the major problems for them is they ignore the context. And they want to add the word water when it's not there. They, well, they want to add the word baptism when it's not there. Notice verse 28 says there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither male nor female. This shows that this is spiritual, spiritually speaking. Because in Christ... You're neither male nor female, but spiritually speak, speaking, see, spiritually speaking, you are, you are neither male nor female, and I meant to write physically speaking, you still are male or female. I mean, just because you got saved doesn't change your you being physically male or female. I hope it do, doesn't anyway. I mean, we're not part of the gender neutral movement here. I mean, you still... Spiritually speaking, you're neither Jew nor Greek. Spiritually speaking, you're neither bond nor free or male nor female. But physically, you still are what you are. You're still a male. If, you got, if you're a man and you got saved, you're still a male physically speaking. But in Christ, spiritually speaking, you're neither male nor female. And that shows you that the baptism here is a spiritual baptism. It's not talking about water baptism. And in the context of the entire chapter, it's about spiritual things. And being baptized into Christ is the spirit baptism. It has nothing to do with water. The same thing for Romans chapter 6. In Romans 6, 3 through 4, it says, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Once again, this is the spirit baptism and not water baptism. Notice it says baptized into Jesus Christ. We're baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Cross-reference this with Colossians 2, 11 through 13, and it proves it is the spirit baptism. Look, in Colossians 2.11, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Notice, this is a spiritual circumcision because it is the circumcision made without hands. Then look at the next verse, the same as Romans 6. Buried with him in baptism wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. You can easily see that Paul refers here to the spirit baptism and not water baptism. Just as he did in Romans 6, 1 through 4, you got a spirit baptism going on. Water baptism doesn't baptize you into Christ. Water baptism is a picture 
It's a good testimony. It's a good thing. But as it, it doesn't do anything for you, spiritually speaking. Your physical, I mean, think about it. When you get water, water baptized, you have to physically drive to church, physically walk to the front of the church, physically change into a different set of clothes, physically get dunked by the pastor, physically get wet. Everyone sees you with their own two eyes physically doing it, and then you physically dry off. I mean, it's a lot of, I mean, that's works if you think that saves you. That's a lot of physical things that you're doing to be saved right there. And I mean, it's not a spiritual thing. There is one baptism that saves, and that is the spirit baptism. It has nothing to do with water, and you didn't even realize it happened when it happened. And the spirit is the one that did the baptizing. In Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, it says, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. When the Church of Christ approaches this verse, they make the one baptism to be water baptism. They claim there is no spirit baptism since there is only one baptism. They want the one baptism to be water. But listen, there is one baptism in the sense that there is one Lord. You see, there are many gods and many lords, but there's only one God and only one Lord that is the real one, the main one, and the one that saves. You see, look at this. In 1 Corinthians 8, 5, it says, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven and earth, as there be gods many and lords many. Well, I thought this said one Lord, one God. Well, yeah, there is one Lord, one God. There's no contradiction here. It's that in the context, they like to ignore the context. The context is there's one body that you get in to be saved. There's one spirit that saves. There's one Lord that saves. There's one God that saves. There's one faith that saves, even though there's tons of faiths. You can put your faith in just about anything, but there's only one faith that saves. There's only one baptism that saves, even though there's other baptisms in the Bible, which I'll show you later. So the one baptism is the spirit baptism, not water baptism. There are many faiths, but only one faith that saves a man. There is one baptism that saves. It is the main one, and that's the spirit baptism. The Church of Christ does not get that. The next thing is, what is the church? They don't understand what the church is. In Colossians 1.18, it says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. This verse shows that the church is the Lord's body. So does Colossians 1.24, which says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. The church is not a building, it's the Lord's body. Once again, Ephesians 1, 22 through 23, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The one body, back in Ephesians 4, is this body. Once You see, one spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, baptizes you into this body with the one baptism, the spirit baptism, because of your faith, which is the one faith that saves. And it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. That's your spirit baptism. And it says in Romans 12, 5, So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. So the church, which is his body, is made up of every born-again believer. Now listen to this. Whether these people are currently going to a Methodist church, Presbyterian, Catholic, even Church of Christ, Baptist, Seventh-day Adventist, Mormon, or Jehovah's Witness Assembly. The fact that a lot, most of these people are deceived and hooked up with the wrong doctrine and the wrong people. and that these, uh, Some of these are cults and have heresies. That has nothing to do with anything. If there was a time when these people that presently go to these other denominations or cults or churches, if there was a time when they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, then they are in the church, which is his body, even if they are physically going to a satanic biker gang on Sundays. 
All that matters is that there was a time when they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. What they did after that is a completely separate issue. The body of being in the church has nothing to do with where you go to church, with who your pastor is, with whether or not you've been water baptized. And so that's the church, but what are local churches? Look at Romans 16, 16. It says, salute one another with an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Saying I'm a Baptist because of John the Baptist doesn't make good sense. That's obvious. We don't even teach the same thing that John taught today. However, saying you're a Baptist because of John the Baptist makes as much sense as the church of Christ saying they are in the Bible because of Romans 16, 16. There is the church which is his body, and it's made up of every born-again believer, no matter who or where they are. It doesn't matter where they go to church, as long as there was a time when they believed on Christ. Now, it matters where they go to church in the sense of they need to go to a place where they get the right doctrine. But when it comes to their, their salvation, it has nothing to do with where they go to church. But there are also local churches. The churches of Christ talked about here. This is not talking about the church. This is talking about local churches. Notice the ES. The church is of Christ salute you. For the church of Christ to go here as a proof text for themselves is crazy. There's only one the church. This says the church is. This shows you it's talking about local churches and not the church. For example, 1 Corinthians 16, 19, the churches of Asia. That's local churches. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, and to the church of God, which is at Corinth. That's a local church. You see, the saints are a part of the church, which is his body, but we also assemble ourselves together locally with other Christians who are a part of the body. Hebrews 10, 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Well, we're in the same body. We're already together in that sense. But physically speaking, we come together in a local assembly. And the church of Christ basically just uses verses about the church as proof text for their local churches that are just based on false doctrine. The church of Christ, as they call themselves, are not the church built on the rock in Matthew 16, 18. They are nothing but local churches that just don't claim to be a denomination. And they can claim to not be a denomination all they want to. They can claim to be the true church all they want to. But it's not true. They're nothing more than local churches with bad doctrine. If the church of Christ is the church, then why do I see three of them on the same road when I leave my house? I see the Liberty Church of Christ, Central Church of Christ, this other church of Christ, and they may or may not be friends. They may or not believe what each other believes. And they may or not be believe each other are the true church. And there's a lot of pious talk involved. They say, you are a denomination and we are the church. They say, you are a Baptist, Methodist, or Presbyterian, but we are Christians. Did you know that the Church of Christ as a title never even occurs in the Bible? And Romans 16, 16 is not a title. It says the church is of Christ. It's talking about local churches. It's not using that as, an, as a title there. You can go there and say that all you want to. It doesn't make it true. It never occurs in the Bible as a title. Yet they teach, they speak where the scriptures speak and they're silent where the scriptures are silent. Well, it never refers to the church, which is his body as the church of Christ. What about the church of God? That is actually a title given to the church in the Bible. Does that mean only the church of God, the Pentecostals, are the true church? Absolutely not. The church is called several different things, but never the church of Christ. It's called the church of God, the church of the living God, the church which is his body, my church, the church. The church is of Christ. In Romans 16, 16, are just local churches and not the church. So they can't go there to use that as a proof verse. The, ne the name Church of Christ came about in the 1800s by a guy named Barton Stone and Alexander Campbell. And, it, and it's not really a big deal what you call yourself to me. The thing is, they make it a big deal by claiming that they aren't a denomination, 
and are just the true church in the Bible. Otherwise, I wouldn't even bring up their name because we all know you can't find Baptists in the Bible. But you do find Paul and men through history all the way back to the apostles who taught salvation was by grace through faith without works and without water baptism. You don't find men going around teaching water baptism for salvation other than Catholics until the 1800s. So this would mean that God didn't show men the way of salvation for over a thousand years until Campbell showed up teaching the right way to be saved with baptismal regeneration. The Church of Christ is similar to Catholics in that they claim to be the true church and that outside of them there is no salvation. Whether they realize it or not, they claim to be in control of the blood of Jesus because they teach the blood of Jesus isn't implied applied to you unless you are baptized in water by one of their elders. That puts them up there pretty high. But let's get this straight. Being in the church has nothing to do with who you are, where you're from, what local church you go to, water baptism, or how you're living. It has to do with have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. So how do you get in the church, which is his body? Well, first off, who did the work that made it possible for you to get in the body? Not you. The Lord Jesus Christ did. In Ephesians 2.16, it says that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. The way into the body of Christ was made possible at the cross. Jesus Christ did all the work that was required for you to get saved. You just had to believe. In Colossians 2, 13 through 14, it says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 17 through 18, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved is the power of God. Colossians 1.20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross. Romans 3.24-25 talks about propitiation through faith in his blood. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins. He shed his blood. And if you will come to him as a guilty sinner and believe on him and his finished work on the cross, he did all the work. He made it possible to get in the body. If you come to him and believe on him and his finished work on the cross to pay your sin debt, then you can be saved and you will be baptized into the church, which is his body. Now, physical birth versus spiritual birth. They got this all messed up. The Church of Christ gets all messed up in John chapter 3. They don't understand that Jesus Christ is referring to a man's fleshly birth when he was born of his mother, and then his second birth, which is his spiritual birth when he gets saved. Your first, your first birth was no good, because when you were born of your mother, you were born a sinner. That's why you need a second birth. That's why you need to be born again. Your second birth is what gets you saved. And it was, that's what puts you into the family of God. But look at this story here. In John chapter 3 and verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus is telling him that the first birth is no good. He wants him to know that a man has to be born again. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus thinks Jesus is referring to two fleshy births. He doesn't understand the second birth is a spiritual birth. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. When the Church of Christ hits this verse, they claim that born of water means water baptism. They completely ignore the context, but look at the next verse, and it defines what born of water means. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Born of water is born of the flesh. What happened when your mother had you? Her water broke. Being born of water is your first birth, the fleshy birth. When you were born of a woman, it is not water baptism. That first birth was no good because you were born a sinner. The second birth is when you are born of the Spirit, and that is what got you in the family of God. 
Jesus said, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So how do you get born again into the family of God? You guessed it. Galatians 3.26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, not by water baptism. John 1.12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. More proof that born of water is the flesh, fleshy birth is in 1 John 5, 6, which says, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And this is the spirit that beareth witness, because the spirit is truth. He came by water and blood. has to do with Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. And that's what John was talking about in the previous chapter in 1 John 4, 3, where it said, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. The, fle the born of water is not water baptism. It's a fleshy birth. I want you to notice the difference when you really look at it between water baptism and spirit baptism. Remember that in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it said, For by one spirit, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. That's the Holy Spirit doing the baptizing. But when you look at the verses where a man's being baptized in water, it says something completely different. In Matthew 3.11, when John's doing the baptizing, John said, I indeed baptize you. He didn't say anything about the Spirit doing the baptizing. John himself was doing the baptizing and not the Spirit. And that's why he said, There cometh one after me who's mightier than I, and he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. In Matthew 3.13, Jesus came to John to be baptized of him. It had nothing to do with a spirit baptism. Water baptism is it's different than spirit baptism. In Acts 8.38, when... Philip baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch. It says, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And obviously, baptizing him in the water, and it's not the Spirit baptizing him into the body of Christ. So there's, it's a completely different thing. But the Church of Christ, they're going to say because of Ephesians 4.4, 4, it says that there's one baptism. And they, once again, they don't take the context into consideration. There's one baptism in the sense there's one baptism which saves. There's one Lord which saves. There's one faith which saves. There's, there's one body. There's one spirit. But they forget about the verses where it says there's God's many and Lord's many. They forget about the fact that there's more than one faith. There's faith in all these other religions, but those those faiths do not save. There's one faith which saves. There's one baptism which saves, but there's more than one baptism. In the Bible, it, look at a, Hebrews 6, 2. It says, of the doctrine of baptisms, more than one, plural, this shows there's more than one baptism in the Bible, and not all of them have to do with water, even. So this is really going to help you when you uh, approach a Church of Christ person, or they approach you and try to change your mind. You know that there's more than one baptism in the Bible. And not every time it says the word baptism, it doesn't t refer to water baptism. And every time it says water, it doesn't refer to baptism. Uh, one baptism is John's baptism. In John one thirty one, his baptism was to manifest Jesus to Israel. It's what it says in John one thirty one. Now, when your pastor baptizes you after you got saved, that didn't have anything to do with manifesting Jesus to Israel. So that's why it's a little bit different there. And then you got the spirit baptism in 1 Corinthians 12.13. Had nothing to do with water. Happened to the moment you got saved. You didn't even know what happened. It had nothing to do with water. The baptism of fire in Matthew 3, 11 through 12. That, that has nothing to do with water. Because they're not. You don't even get water in hell. When Jesus took our hell on the cross. 
did he get water? Red Sea Crossing in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 2. Uh, that's, that's referred to as a baptism. When Moses and the children of Israel went through the Red Sea, the water didn't touch them. That was called a baptism. It didn't have anything to do with anybody getting wet other than Pharaoh and his army. Peter's baptism for Israel after they crucified their Messiah in Acts 2.38, almost just like John's baptism, but it's it's still a little bit different because, because the message is a little bit different. And then you got the baptism of suffering in Matthew 20, 22 through 23. That had nothing to do with water. Jesus referring to the baptism of his death on the cross. What did he say on the cross? He said, I thirst. It had nothing to do with water. And then you've got the believer's baptism. And you see in Acts 8, 36 through 38, the Ethiopian eunuch getting water baptized after he believes. You see in Acts 10, 47, the, uh, the Cornelius getting water baptized after he believes, after he received the Holy Ghost. And like I said, we don't just completely follow acts blindly you can go over to first corinthians 1 and see that paul had baptized some people and paul himself was water baptized he says follow me he, he instructs to follow him as he follows christ the lord jesus was baptized so it seems like a good pattern to me for a christian to be water baptized after he's saved it doesn't save anybody. It doesn't do anything for you spiritually. It just, you're really just getting wet. It's a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection. So, there's more than one baptism. Not all of them have to do with water. There's one that saves, and that's the spirit baptism. Now, this other thing that comes up when you talk about the Bible with the Church of Christ is the thief on the cross. The story about the dying thief definitely isn't the first place that I personally would go when showing someone how to be saved. Like, I don't just take them to the thief on the cross. But since this comes up so much with the Church of Christ, and it kind of shows some inconsistencies in their doctrine, uh, I want to point it out. But they teach that as soon as Jesus Christ dies that things begin to operate just like they are in operation today. But they ignore the transitional nature in the book of Acts. And they claim that the dying thief getting saved without water baptism doesn't count because it is still technically under the Old Testament. In Luke 23, 42 through 43, it says, And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That's what the dying thief said. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Here the Lord clearly tells the dying thief that he will be in paradise. So that proves that he's saved. The church of Christ claims that this doesn't count because it's still under the Old Testament since the Lord hasn't died yet. And this is still under the Old Testament. That is correct because in Hebrews 9.16, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So the New, the, the New Testament doesn't officially start until Jesus Christ dies, and, and Jesus hadn't died yet when he said that to the dying thief. However, don't forget that the thief died under the New Testament. Jesus dies before the dying thief dies, and that's proven in John nineteen thirty two through 36. It says, Then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first, and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he, he saith true, that ye might believe. These things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. You see, Jesus died before the dying thief. So the dying thief died under the New Testament. And they say that as the moment that Jesus died, we're in we're operating they were operating like we're operating today. Well if that's true, 
that ignores the transition. And you don't want to ignore the transition going on in the book of Acts. But since he died under the New Testament, this would prove water baptism isn't required to be saved under the New Testament. Because the dying thief, he died after Jesus, was never water baptized, was never able to prove any works, but the Lord prophesied, he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He prophesied that about the dying thief before he died. No water baptism. He was baptized into suffering on the cross, but no water baptism. So you see that there? Also, think about this. Compare water baptism with circumcision. During Paul's day, the big fight was on whether or not circumcision was required for salvation. But today, it's not about circumcision, but rather, have you been water baptized? And I want you to look at these verses that talk about circumcision, but think about anything that you would add to salvation. Water baptism, for example. If the physical sign of circumcision is not required for salvation, then why would water baptism be required for salvation? Look at Romans 4, and you're going to see Abraham. the One of the greatest Old Testament examples for salvation by faith alone is Abraham. It says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Now watch this. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Here's the answer. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So Abraham got righteousness before he was circumcised. Just like you get righteousness before you're baptized, before you read the Bible, before you won your first soul to the Lord, before you became a regular member of a church. Those things have nothing to do with salvation. They have to do with discipleship. They have to do with your Christian walk. See, they were trying to add physical circumcision to the gospel. All that is is just a just something they could brag about. In Galatians 6:12 it says as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. They want to make you see, that's just like a church of Christ. They want to convert a Baptist over to the church of Christ. That way they can glory in your flesh. It says, For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh, just like they would have loved to take one of Paul's converts and make him believe that circumcision saves you, as, or what puts the, the uh, cherry on top of your salvation, of their salvation. The Church of Christ would love to get a Baptist or a Bible believer like you and make you think that water baptism puts the cherry on top of your salvation. And they do this, that they may glory in your flesh. You see, you can prove them wrong 20 times. And if they get one over on you one time, then they are happy. That helps their ego. That helps their pride. And if they can get one of your guys, they can glory in his flesh. They can brag, and, and it makes them feel good because they bested you on something. 
But it says, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the Lord is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And I know this is talking about circumcision. But if circumcision doesn't save, how does water baptism save? If any good work that you do after salvation doesn't save, how does water baptism save? And how do you not consider water baptism a work? I mean, that's an honest question. How would that not be a work? It's something you you physically do. It's something people physically see. They could actually record it with the, on video and have pictures of it. That's not something that's happen, happening by faith. You see? I mean, you may be... Your, your faith may lead you to do it, but it's not something that you're... That's just, that's a faith thing. It's not a spiritual thing. It's a physical thing. And it does nothing for you spiritually. And like I've been saying, they overlook the transitional nature of the Gospels and the Book of Acts. The Church of Christ ignores the transition period. And they take verses from the transition period and the Book of Acts to override clear doctrinal verses from the Pauline Epistles. That's horrible way. To, to look at the Bible. That's like going to the Old Testament and overriding the uh, verses about animal sacrifice, using those verses to override the clear teachings that Jesus is our sacrifice for today. Or they'll take Mark 16, 16 and use that to override uh, the clear teachings of Paul. For example, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, where he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. They'll override Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Romans 4, 5, with Mark 16, 16. It's, a unclear, it's not as much of a clear verse, and it's being said to disciples who have the sign gifts. Look at this. In Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So that's what they'll proclaim, and they stop right there. They don't read the context. They don't read the whole verse half the time, and they'll say, see, you got to believe and be baptized, but they got to read the rest of the verse. It says, but he that believeth not shall be damned. It's not he that isn't baptized shall be damned, and then they don't read the next verses. It says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Why don't the Church of Christ do none of these things if this is supposed to be taken directly for today anyway in my name shall they cast out devils they shall speak with new tongues the church of christ does not cast out devils the church of christ does not speak with tongues and neither do we but this just shows that they're completely taking verses that are during a transition time of transition and using them to override the clear verses from paul and it says they take up serpents i don't see any church of christ snake handling and if they drink any deadly thing, I don't see a Church of Christ drinking Drano to confirm the word with signs following. So they ignore the transitional nature of God, the Gospels, the book of Acts, and they don't care when they get to the book of Acts that men were getting the Holy Spirit in different ways throughout the book. You know why that I don't take things in the book of Acts and override Paul's epistles with the book of Acts? is because... It's a transition period, and th different things were happening, and they were even getting the Holy Spirit in different ways throughout the book of Acts. In Acts 2.38, they were getting the Holy Spirit after they got water baptized. In Acts 10.47, they, uh, they got the Holy Spirit before baptism, just like we do today. And in Acts 19, they got the Holy Spirit after Paul laid his hands on them. See, Paul had laid his hands upon them. The Holy Ghost came on them. You see, through the book of Acts, it's a transition. The Lord's switching from Jew to Gentile. He's going from the, the offer of the kingdom still being on the table to the Jews, to their crossover from that, to their final rejection, and then transitioning into the church. So you see how it's a transition book. But then the Lord makes sure that in the Pauline epistles that it's 
that it's got the church doctrine clearly laid out for us today. He made sure that that's what came through in the Pauline epistles. And that's our primary instruction that we go by. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't get doctrine out of anywhere of the Bible. But you got to make sure that it's matching what Paul says. There's no contradictions in the Bible. It's just that some of it is instru direct instructions for our persons in the Old Testament or during the transition period or during today or during the tribulation period. Now, another thing they do, they mess up by interpreting the clear in light of the unclear. That's a big one. And I mean, I've already talked about this a hundred times already. They take the unclear verses, the very few that they have. Not only do they misrepresent them, misinterpret them, take them out of context, add something to them and take something away from them after they have completely demolished the verse and rested that verse to their own destruction they will then proceed to use that un, which is most likely an unclear verse anyway they'll use that unclear verse that they've destroyed and they'll interpret the clear verses from the Pauline epistles using that unclear verse that they've destroyed to make it even further unclear and that is their plan to deceive you and if you do not study the Bible and learn what I'm trying to tell you here, you will be, you would be deceived by them. Now, don't get played like a fiddle or a banjo. The Church of Christ teaches that their people, teaches their people that musical instruments are not allowed in the local church, which is funny because they are playing you like a fiddle the whole service by telling you that. They are playing a stringed instrument every service because they are playing their people like a fiddle. They say that since instruments aren't mentioned in the New Testament, that you can't use them. That's a horrible way to live your Christian life. So they take away the banjos. Well, what about lemonade? I don't see lemonade in the Bible. Does that mean you can't drink it at a, a church fellowship? You have an air conditioner at the local church of Christ. Where does the Bible talk about using an air conditioner? Where does the Bible talk about using conditioner? What if you use conditioner before you got there? I see a church of Christ right next to my house that has an elementary school. Where is that at in the Bible? Just because something isn't in the Bible doesn't mean it is wrong. Just because something isn't in the New Testament doesn't mean it is wrong. But the two verses that the church of Christ used to be anti-instrument during worship is Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3.16. And they use and they say that because, well, you don't find instruments in those verses. It doesn't say to use instruments, so therefore we, we can't use them. Well, what about all the other things that you use during your church service that aren't in there? If we can look at these verses, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, let the word of Christ dwell in you rich with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So it says psalms, right? If we can use, if we can speak to ourselves in psalms, and teach and admonish one another in Psalms, then the greatest song book would be the book of Psalms, right? I mean, that's a hymn book built into your Bible. So sure, Psalms is in the Old Testament, but Paul said teaching and admonishing one another in Psalms. But look what Psalms says. In Psalm 150 and verse 4, praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Psalm 33, 2 and 3, praise the Lord with harp, sing unto him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings, sing unto him a new song, play skillfully with a loud voice. You say, well, Psalms don't count because that's Old Testament. Well, Paul thought they counted. He quoted them all the time. In Romans 4, 6 through 8, even as David, this is Paul talking and he's quoting David, he says, even as David also described the blessedness of the man whom God imputed the righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. If the if the Old Testament just doesn't count, then why does Paul quote the Psalms? That's Paul quoting from Psalm 32. I mean, is the church of Christ, church building, more separated than heaven itself? You say, why do you ask? Well, you say you can't use musical instruments, but the Lord's got musical instruments in his worship service in heaven. 
They say the New Testament doesn't give the okay for instruments. Well, what about in Revelation 5, 8? It says, when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Revelation 15, 2. And I, was, I, and I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. If God is allowing his creatures to worship with harps in heaven before his throne, what makes you think you can't use them today? I mean, that's in eternity. Isn't it a little bit more advanced than what you're dealing with right now in your church building? I mean, technically, your church building isn't even in the New Testament. They were meeting in each other's houses. Your church building is not as important as you're making it out to be. The Church of Christ, these people that get together and say that water baptism is required for salvation, that is not the church. They're nothing more than local churches that have bad doctrine. 